What's up? Welcome in Hogue and John's with you with a special episode. We've actually been planning for a few weeks now, uh, actually probably over a month, um, but we're just finally getting around to it now because there's been so much coaching news and things moving around. Um, but we are happy to welcome Josh Lucas back to the podcast to do a little end of season personnel meeting type podcast where we've been talking about this. We've been uh, planning it. And I think it's I think uh, I think our listeners are really going to enjoy this. But what's up, Josh? How you guys doing? Thanks for having me in. And yeah, this is, um, you know, all 32 teams are going to have this meeting eventually. You know, I'm sure 30 of the 32 are, are, are wrapping it up. And even Kansas City and, and San Francisco will have this meeting at some point in time. So you got you got to take a snapshot on both sides of the ball. You got to know where, you know, as far as your offseason plans and needs are. Um you know, and it's, I think, I think the most important thing is probably to have this meeting in your building with your coaches and your scouts, your GM, your head coach, probably a week or two after the season, because you want to uh, remove emotion from this. It's, a, you know, you're coming off a really good season that can kind of taint the picture a little bit on how you see some of your players. You're coming off a really bad season that can kind of move the needle a little bit. So you want to re- you want to remove that emotion from how the season went. Look at the film. And the most important thing about this meeting is to have coaches, scouts, and personnel directors who are willing to be honest and have conviction. You don't want scouts and coaches in there that know what the GM thinks, know what the head coach thinks, and then are just going to ride, you know, just ride the fence, play it safe. You know, there's there's a lot of survivors in the NFL and the coaching and scouting world. Those guys, to me, they don't help out when when they're not given what they honestly think. So you want people in there. To, hey, I don't think Justin Fields is good. He's not good enough. You know you know, even if that goes against the popular consensus in the room and that goes for all positions, obviously not just the quarterback. So this, this meeting is um, a good snapshot and it's important that people are, are honest and, and have conviction about how they feel about the players. So if you're the bears, you just hired Shane Waldron, you just hired new defensive coordinator and Eric Washington, like, has this meeting already happened or I'm sure you have information from your new coaches already, but does this happen after, well, the senior bowl week when the staff is fully flushed out, everybody is hired. Do you wait to this, this new coaching staff, especially offensively is well full. Yeah. I think they could have broken it up without a doubt. I'm, I'm willing to assume they waited a little bit for the offense because that's going to – that changes the whole landscape because now you're bringing in a new offensive coordinator who has a new vision on how you want to play offensive football. And they need time to watch the tape and to, to, to digest, you know, what they see on that 2023 Bears film and what they feel about Justin Fields, what they feel about Braxton Jones. Um, and on the defensive side – it's a defensive coordinator hire, but we, I think we all know it's, you know, there's a little semantics to that. It's, it's more just the title. You know, we know who the defensive coordinator is. It's the head coach. Um, that meeting could have probably already taken place because this new DC's opinion on the players probably isn't going to move the needle as much, but on the offensive side of the ball, it's a great point. They, they may have, they may have well waited. Uh, and, and still not even had the meeting and given this new offensive staff time to see these new these Chicago Bears players. So here's how this is going to work. Um, first of all, we're going to do two of these. So today's episode is just the offense. So we will we will come back and do defense, uh, I think, later on this week. But this is an offensive show. So offensive personnel meeting, we're going to discuss the players and put them into categories that Josh has provided to us similar. uh, And Josh, I'll let you add anything to this. You want to set this up, but the categories, you essentially have six categories going from one to six, one being a top player, 
Um, good to better than good on a good team, essentially a Pro Bowl caliber player. Two, the second category, good, solid starter. You can win with now. Third category is average, a starter slash backup with a contributing role currently with some upside. Could also include a four-core special teams player. Four is an interesting category called circumstance. So young, unsure, feel somewhat positive, um, but it's a player you want to work with. Five, you get to below average. We're talking a backup, not really established. Um, basically a fill-in player to get to your 90-man roster, which you need in the offseason before you whittle things down in training camp. And then the last category, the sixth category, time to move on from probably still has some talent to play a role for a team in the league, but not a fit with the Bears right now. Time to move on from them. Anything else you want to add to that before we start putting these players in these categories? This is a very, you know, I, I try to, you know, knowing this show is we, we can't meet here for three hours. I try to make it as simple as possible. Um, not too dissimilar from uh, a, a scale we would use with the Saints and the Bears during my time with both teams. Um, and it just gives you a real quick snapshot. Now, nowadays, you're bringing analytics into it um, to, to predict future you know, whether, uh, you know, acceleration or deceleration with a player, we're going to keep it nice and sweet. It's going to be us three just using our heads, putting these guys in categories and, and seeing where the Bears look strong, where they look weak and where they need to add. So um, this is an episode. Uh, we're going to make this digestible for everybody listening to the podcast, of course. But if you want to watch on YouTube, we do have our producer, Kent, put together some cool graphics and tiers here that we're going to be placing these players in to help you visually follow along as well. So might be a good episode uh, to check out on YouTube if you're not already watching here. And of course, uh, you can find that on our Hogue and John's YouTube channel. Please hit subscribe. We appreciate the support there. Um, we're going to go by position group here. So let's start with the offensive line. I know everyone wants to talk about Justin Fields. We're going to save the quarterback. To the end. Um, we call that talk. bearing the lead. Yeah. <laughs> uh, or teasing what everybody wants to hear later. Um, so let's start with the O-line. And uh, you just want to go left to right? How do you want to do this, Josh? Yeah, let's go left to right. Start with Braxton. You know, I'll just give my opinion real quick. You guys chime in. You know, this, this player really reminds me of our situation we had with, with Charles Leno. A late round pick, left tackle. Is he good enough? Do you need a little bit better? You know, I would say watching Braxton early this year, I thought I was really impressed. I thought he played well and his tape declined. Um, his performance wasn't as good as the season um, went on. I'll always be worried about that narrow base. He gets rocked back in pass protection. He doesn't have great anchor. To me, he's that three category. You know, to me, he's not for sure a good starting left tackle on every team in this league. He's more of that, you know, in the middle, you know, average starter, you know, and, and, and to me, this is probably a one guy that they're talking about long term. Is this guy good enough to be a starting left tackle for us going forward? I'm glad you brought up Charles Leno Jr. because that's the that's the name I like wrote down myself as a comp. And you guys eventually what will stuck with him. And he, he he's like I'm pulling up his, his his numbers here. And like he started, let's see here, 94 games for the Bears over 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 seven years. Um and he was a later round pick than Braxton. Um I, I guess to me, like if, if I'm in this room, like like if I'm at nine, like can I find an upgrade over Braxton Jones potentially in the draft? Because I'm not pursuing it in free agency. Like is if Joe Alt is there from Notre Dame at number nine, do I take him? So I'm fine with him at this this three grade, this this average grade. Um, I know he only gave up two sacks this year. I don't like the injury. He only played in eleven games. Um, so I'm concerned about that. Third year. Could get better, but to, but to me, I think the real conversations come like what happens in the draft, and I'm potentially looking at major 
like significant p- potential upgrades over Braxton Jones at left tackle that I have to consider. Yeah, I mean, I, I look at it like um, not a spot you have to upgrade, but if there's an obvious player that you think can come in and you know give you stability at a very high level at that position for a long time, I wouldn't pass on it. Um, and I'm curious, Josh, is that kind of how you guys – looked at the Charles Leno situation every, every single year. Yeah. Every single year. Is there a chance to upgrade? We obviously showed, you know, in 2018, we went 12 and four, you know, we had Leno at left tackle, James Daniel at guard, Kyle Long at guard, Cody Whitehair at center and uh, Massey at right tackle. Our offensive line was not the reason we lost in the playoffs. You know, like those guys were good enough to get us to where we needed to go. And I think Braxton's probably very similar to to Charles in that he's good enough if if they can upgrade in other areas that they see that they have, you know, more of a weakness. That's probably what they'll do um, going forward. And and obviously, too, you know, we I should have said this before, the relationship between the position coach and the player carries a ton of weight as well. How does that offensive line coach view Braxton Jones does he love him does he see a hungry passionate I want to be the best left tackle in the league does he see a guy that's just kind of in the middle committed that that'll that'll carry a lot of weight for every player as well going forward but I think putting him in that average category is very fair also relevant to the conversation um perhaps with his tape declining as the season went along at least compared to the start he did suffer a neck injury no doubt. And missed some time. Um, I think other than that one injury, he's been proven to be a pretty durable player through his first two years. He played every snap as a rookie. But um, that could either be something they're worried about going forward or, you know, a valid excuse perhaps for, you know, maybe the tape declining a little bit as the season. For sure. We, we won't have com- complete information like they have in that room. So, but uh, that, that'll that definitely play a a part in their uh, long-term thinking. I'm good with him there in that category as well. So a category three player with Braxton Jones average. And then we move on to left guard with Tevin Jenkins. Tevin Jenkins. Wow. It's it's extremely talented player to me that I would put in the good category. He is a true difference maker. You wish he was a little bit more consistent in pass pro. He'll play a little high and straight leg, and you'll see him, you know, lose too easily at times. But he's an absolute dog in the run game. He moves bodies. These guys are hard to find. I, I would, I wouldn't be, you know, he, he's got the ability to get to the top player. But the concern for me with Tevin going forward is just going to be, can he stay on the field? And I think that's everyone's concern. Can we trust this guy to stay on the field? But as far as a player right now, for me, it's easy f- to put him in that good category. Yeah, I like him in that that second, the number two good, solid starter um, category. You just can feel the difference, you know, from sitting up in the press box to, to rewatching it, you know, from, you know, from the, the end zone view later. You, you could feel the line moves. You could see it. You could see the impact. You could count the pancakes. Um, yes, the durability is a major issue. I, I think it's going to prevent him from getting a second contract, at least immediately. I think he has to prove he could be durable for an elongated time this season. But I think he is solidly in that number two category. You, you just know the Bears' offensive line is better. The run game works better when he's on the field. So for time purposes, I'm just going to say I agree with you guys because I do. But my follow-up question is – because I agree with what John just said. I'm not in a hurry right now to give him a contract extension, even though he falls under that candidate as a, as a player going into his fourth year um, because of the durability. How does that impact the same thing we were just asking about Braxton Jones, though? If an opportunity for an upgrade comes along, given that he's going into his fourth year, Josh, how do you handle that? Yeah, no, knowing this person, having drafted this person, um, you know, you guys saw what happened at the beginning of training camp last year when he fell into the doghouse, um, the durability included. This is an 
extremely interesting conversation that's going inside of house hall right now, because you have a player that's hard to replace, hard to find, hard to trust, which makes decision-making very difficult. And you're exactly right. Like they, they, they could sit back. They might just be saying, Hey, we're going to ride this out. See if he can play. Um, enough games to show he's worth paying in this four season coming up. They might be saying right now with Nate Davis, you know, really only only on contract for two more years, we need to get a guard right now because we don't trust Tevin. They, they, they could have made their minds up already. Like we'll have Tevin for one more year. And then, you know, we got to get someone in here. We has that has more accountability that we trust more. So it's, you hate for a player this talented to be having that kind of discussion because it's it's usually you want to get them signed as fast as possible because you need these building blocks that are part of the foundation of what what you're building going forward. All right, let's move on to center and Lucas Patrick. This one's easy for me. You know, I put him in the move on category. Um, the play has been wildly inconsistent. Um, he's had durability issues. He's been a disappointment to me for two years. They're, he's not good enough. Um, you know, does he hang around and, and, and you end up re-signing him as, as your sixth and he's just your backup guy? Um, you know, that's a possibility. But to me, for me, I think it's just clear. It's just a guy, hey, we need to get better here. We need to get younger. We need to get more talented. Um, and to me, he'd be a guy, you know, he's a free agent coming up that I would just say, Hey, you know, let, let him go, you know, have the rest of his career in another city. And for us, we need a young, solid starting center that, that we can build and grow and, 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 and really, really count on as, as being a difference maker on the offensive line. Yeah. I, I think it's time to draft the center, like a true center with considerable collegiate experience. I don't want to move a guard to center or anything like that. I think the Bears have to draft uh, a true center. Um, without Luke Getze in the room, like my thought, move on. And from the Bears' perspective, without Luke Getze in the room, I don't think Lucas Patrick is going to have that support system, I guess, in these evaluations and these conversations. So I could see the Bears moving on. That's my vote. Yeah, and I think like the only thing I would add on the positive side is I always do like seeing how – um you know, I hate to read too much into demeanor during games, but he does play hard. You know, he's always there picking up the quarterback when the quarterback's on the ground. Um, he seems like a, a a decent enough leader in that locker room. So I do think there's some value to him on the roster, but I agree with everything you guys have said in terms of what the actual tape shows on the field. It's far too inconsistent. And I think this is important too to kind of explain these categories that Josh has laid out to us because, you know, when we talk about some of these, you know, how do you just fall from like, good all the way down to move on well you look at how we look at the average category you know we're talking about a contributing role currently yes upside with lucas patrick like i I don't think so i don't think it's going to get you know he's at his point in his career he kind of is what he is circumstance well he's not young anymore um he's not necessarily someone you want to continue to work with to try to get better and um you know, I don't think he fits that below average tier where you're just trying to fill out your 90 man roster. So I think that's where you fall all the way down to like, okay, just the general circumstance for a veteran at his point, it's probably just time to move on and get somebody younger. Is that is that kind of sometimes how you would process this with some of these more veteran type players, Josh? 100%. And he's a free agent. So this isn't a, isn't a decision where you have to cut. This is a guy that, hey, if he stays out there and he's on the open market, and you, you end up drafting a player you think is going to be a center and you don't really have, you feel like, let's say, let's say they move on from Cody White here too. And you get into June and he's still out there on the market and, and they're, Hey, we like his leadership. We know in an emergency situation, he can go play guard center. You can always bring him back, you know, but I think the vision initially to me would be, he's not, he's not in my 90 going forward right now. And if he's sitting out there late, and we haven't filled that spot, and we can get him on the real cheap, then then that's an opportunity and a possibility as well. But my guess is he'll be on an, another team next year. All right, let's go over to right guard then, and Nate Davis. So you know, Nate would be a player I would place in the you know good category. 
I, I think you would get some arguments that, you know, he could slide into that average category based on how he played this year. There's probably some reasons to that. He sounds like he had a tumultuous off season, went through a lot personally. I think, you know, he didn't have a great camp. Um, at the end of the day, though, when you compare him to gu guards across the league, you look at his numbers, you know, he only gave up one sack, 30 pressures, you know, he was at 7.8% percentage um, pressure rate, which is the highest of his career, and he missed six games this year. So, you know, it wasn't a great year for him, but the tape, when, when you watch him play, you know, he has two, I feel like two or three moments every game where he just has a whiff and just has a terrible set. But really, when you grade the tape out over 70, 75 reps, he's pretty solid. He's good in the run game. He can set a firm pocket in the pass game. You know, he's got he's a good athlete. To me, to me, I would put him in the good category. I know there could be some you know argument probably be throughout the building uh, on a player like this. I do think it's imperative. He has a better year two than he had a year one, uh, or he's going to be you know at risk of getting cut after next year. I think this is where I would bring up like all the circumstances: it is the family stuff, the 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 injuries, the new team. All of that, I, I think, needs to be part of this conversation. So if I'm arguing this case, like I, I still believe in his signing. I still believe in what he did in Tennessee. And I believe in giving him the benefit of the doubt because of my belief in, well, our decision-making to sign him in the first place. So I'm going to keep him in the good category because I still think that was a good signing. Maybe some a more, what's the best, a, a, maybe a more stable offseason for him. Again, his family situation, the injuries, that should help him come 2024. That's my argument. There's a relevant comp here, maybe not in terms of total talent, because I don't want to compare these players just in terms of, you know, how you know what their actual upsides might be. But Robert Quinn kind of went through a similar type of thing when he got to Chicago where it was just like, and there was COVID involved in that too, but it was a, sort of an uncomfortable situation for the family in the first year and everything was disjointed and he just never really got going. And then it was that next year, once he was comfortable that, you know, he set the, that was year two, right? When he was with the bears. Where he two, set, I, I was yeah. just going to say the yeah. same thing, Adam, it's a great comparison. It, it happens to a lot of players throughout the league. You know, some players transition. You saw what Montez Sweat did in the middle of the year this year, you know, to do it in the middle of the season versus, you know, having a whole off season. Some guys just struggle with it. You know, it, it's a major change. He's only been in one city. Some guys get it really quickly. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if his play is more um, consistent and even more productive next year because he's more comfortable. Um, I think that's a great point. And I think this is where, like, the – the people part of this gets kind of lost. This has to be tough in the room too. Like Nate Davis had a family member pass away like oh, yeah. early in the season. And this is what he was dealing with, you know, throughout the summer when everyone's wondering where he is and what's going on. And this is a person dealing with, you know, a, a personal family tragedy in, in a sense. So I still like the signing. Um, it, it actually kind of makes the conversations kind of hard to have sometimes I would imagine, but if I'm the Bears, I still believe in what he could provide this football team up front. 100%. So I think yeah, and, so and all these players on the offensive line, what they mean to the room, like how they fit the room, they how they glue the room together. Like we're not we're not throwing in that input because we're not in the building. That makes a huge deal. If if one of these four guys we talked about is an asshole and is abrasive, even though you love the talent, sometimes you just have to move on from guys because they ruin the cohesion of the room. Those guys are together every day. They're a family. It's a brotherhood. So, you know, we're just looking at talent. We're just looking at, you know, what we see on tape. Um, and, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're without that information. And that, that's going to play a, a role when you're actually inside House Hall. So I'm good. Keep, yeah, I'm good with keeping him on that good tier. I would probably argue average based on, you know, just what we saw on the tape this year um, and the overall season. But I think once you throw in the circumstances and, you know, the upside that's still there for him to bounce back in the second year with the Bears, I, I, I can live with that. 
All right, let's move on to right tackle and Darnell Wright coming out of his rookie season. Yeah, prized possession of this group, by far the most talented. To me right now, he fits in that. We would have him in that good category with an arrow up knowing that he's got the mo he's got the upward ascension to be a top player in this league. Eight sacks as a rookie, you know, that's awfully high. 13 led the league. When you got eight sacks, hard to say he's a top player in the league. He's got top traits. He's already a dominant run player. He has to get more consistent with his technique. When he loses, it's because he's lazy. He plays high. He's a waist bender and he'll try to He'll try to catch rather than shoot his hands and stab and punch. They can't allow him to, to rest on his laurels and say, hey, he had a good rookie season. Like He's got to get better with his technique to reach his potential because his potential is top player. His potential is just like the guy in Detroit. They're not that different when you watch them on tape, the way they move. Now, Penny Sewell is a better player right now, but when you watch these guys move, how they handle – like contact moving through their hips how they move in space the way they set and pass pro he's got all that ability he just doesn't have the consistency he'd be a good player for me exciting player a player with a big arrow up i'm tempted to put him in in top player just because of those traits and if i'm like projecting like if I like these are our blue chip guys 2024 this is what i expect to be our blue chip guys like i'm starting with darn all right like on the offensive line. Like this is where my expectation is. This is where my demands are going to be for our first round pick in 2023. I think he can be that good. But then, yes, the film, the eight sacks, there's a good amount of pressures allowed there. I think that's where I have to move him down to good. But like that's a really big arrow up. Yes. Like, yeah, I don't oh. know if there's like a, like a, maybe in a different conversation or with a, a different grading scale, there's like a, a section in between there, like it be between those grades, but that's a big arrow up for me just in terms of darn. All right. Yeah. I, you know, in the run game, he is a top player, but yeah, when you throw in the sacks and uh, the penalties, I mean, the penalties were a problem too. And I think that goes back to what Josh was talking about with the technique. Um, you feel this is not a player you're worried about going forward, but it is one that you got to, you know, that is entering an important off season and, and needs to improve those things. So uh, I am 100% in agreement with keeping him in the good tier, but feeling good about him going forward, obviously. To, to, in my opinion, the two biggest off seasons for the Chicago Bears, uh, and we'll talk about the other guy Friday, are Darnell Wright, because he has to be a Pro Bowl, all pro player next year. You need him to be that because you drafted him in the top 10 and, he, and he's that talented. And then Javon Dexter, who we'll talk yeah. about on Friday. Those are the two biggest off seasons, in my opinion. But either way, whether you place 58 in the good or the top player, you're happy with what you selected and, and how he performed this year. All right, we're not going to hit on all the backup O linemen, but there are a couple we do need to discuss. One is obviously Cody Whitehair. So let's start there. So Cody Whitehair is one of the two guys on this roster right now who, who, who we would call a cap casualty. He's still under contract. It's very, very unlikely that he will be on this roster in 2024 under his current contract. So he's going to get cut. Now, you can just place him in the move on category or you can place him on how he actually played this year. That's always a kind of a difficult discussion to have. I put him in the three category, just what he is right now. And we can, and, and you, you know, you can worry the GM and the cap guy can worry about the restructuring. Do we want him back? Everything else going forward. His biggest issue going forward, if he wants to come back, is he's got the yips at center. And now you're looking at a backup guard only. So, I would have no objections to anyone that throw, puts them in the move on category. Um, I think they're going to, they would love to have him back from the character standpoint and his value as a backup guard. When, when Tevin would go out late in the year and, and, and Cody would come in, 
you, there wasn't a huge drop off. He, he's a really good backup guard in this league right now, but he's a backup guard only. And that is very, very hard to um, fit into your roster because you're so limited on game day activation. So he's an average player right now um, that's going to get cut for sure. Um, and it's a, it's a decision on do you try to bring him back at a low number um, or do you just move on and, and let him go on to another team? Yeah, I, I hate to say this because he's been such a consummate pro, um, but I have to pull, put him in the move on category. I think the nine more than $9 million in cap savings for everything we just said about Tevin Jenkins and Nate Davis, I get that you like – like you like the veteran presence and you like the veteran experience to come in place for those guys if they do happen to get hurt. But I also think Cody White here, regardless of what he said after the season, like him saying he wants to be here, I think he might be better off when he thinks about it elsewhere. Maybe he might get that another starting opportunity elsewhere to finish his career how he wants. Um, so as difficult as this is to say for someone who's covered his entire career, I have to put him in the move on category right now. Yeah, I agree with Johns. I think, and for two big reasons, um, the, the 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 not being able to play center position at all now is a problem. I'm um, for for me, there's just you you lost your interior versatility that you had with him at that spot, um, and that's just sort of a deal breaker for me. And then also, as I do agree that when he would step in for Tevin at guard later in the year. Um, he did, you know, he did he did pretty good for a backup. I still think that his play at that position is also arrow down right now, and certainly not arrow up. So, given his age, obviously, once you throw in the the money too, um, I think that you you do put him in that move on category, in my opinion. And so, and and I, I agree. The room would probably be split on this, maybe even more of what you guys are saying. In a perfect scenario, a guy that loves being a Chicago Bear, if he could play functionally at center, you you would love to cut him, re-sign him on a very team-friendly deal, and he's your sixth, and you you are so happy because you have a hell of a dude. You got a guy that's capable, but the yips at center is is what's causing him to 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 probably end up in this move on category. Yeah, absolutely. And then the last offensive lineman we're going to discuss is Larry Borum, um, who's basically fallen out of the you know any chance of of, of starting at this point. Um, but Josh, what do you, what category would you put him in now? Yeah, he's he's a you know I think when you look around the league at third tackles, you know he's a he's a solid third tackle. He's not going to be a starter. I'm personally disappointed on his progression from when we got him as a rookie to now i thought he had a really good preseason this year i thought he would play well if he had the chance to play this year and his play was just too inconsistent and and the the washington game really stands out where he was abysmal he was absolutely awful and and justin saved his ass several times he's 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 on a rookie deal so he will be on the team. He'll be on the roster. If he's your third tackle, you're fine with that. You could probably put him in the – I mean, he's a guy that I'm sure some people think's a three. Some people probably could say he could still be a four. Maybe he's a five. Um, so for me, he's an average starter backup with a contributing role. I don't know how much upside there is. He's kind of one of these tweener guys. I left him in the three category. He's a he's a he's a good – third tackle um but he, he's never going to be good enough um from what he's shown to be a starter so, so here's a question i have from you um now i'm not 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 now i left the room not in the room right now like i don't like that oh, oh uh, no never mind i'm coming back into the room josh i'm coming back in i don't like that like braxton jones and larry borum are like in the same category like i don't know if it's just because i think braxton is significantly better um has, has started more um, seems to be more reliable. The sack numbers are still pretty good, and Larry just has struggled to solidify his his standing, even as even as a backup. So, like maybe we move. I would move Larry down the circumstance. Still young. I like his circumstance of being on like 
his rookie contract. So to your point, I 100% agree with you. Like, keep him. He's on your roster. It's maybe you draft a guy late and that's his competition. But right now, rookie deal, backup swing tackle, I like him. Like, that makes sense to me. But I just don't like him in that same category as Braxton Jones. Yeah, it's it went and it's fine. I, I love that you said that because yeah. every single one of these meetings I've ever been in, you always get into that situation where yeah. you you're putting guys in the same category where you really don't feel the same way about them, um, and it just happens, especially when you were doing some a simple exercise like this. I I, I totally agree with you that Braxton has shown to be a better player. Um, and, and I would have no argument, you know, lowering Larry, the bottom line is rookie, uh, cheap third tackle. He's on your team and you try to improve by drafting better. Yeah. And as I do this during the season, um, I kind of categorize players and I have one that's called fringe starter. And that's kind of, I think right where we're at here yep. with, you know, a guy who's someone you obviously keep around cause he's got he's still on that last year of his rookie deal. He's not a starting caliber tackle, but in a pinch, he can, he can go in there and, and, and help you out. So I am, uh, I'm going to put him in that circumstance category too. And for maybe the biggest reason is because when you laid out these categories, Josh, you put the word unsure in the circumstance category. And that's like kind of how I am with Larry board. I'm like, there's still something there, but I'm I'm a little unsure still about what exactly that is. So he's on a rookie deal, later round pick. Just keep him around, see what happens here in year four. Yeah, the the body and the movement and the length, average length, but enough. He should be a better player than he is. Our concern coming out of Missouri was he wasn't tough and gritty enough, and I think that's I think that has been why. He hasn't ascended in this league. He lets the game come to him. He doesn't attack defenders. Um, and I don't think that's ever going to change and probably just going to keep him kind of on that fringe starter level. All right, let's move on to tight end now. Um, and three guys we got to discuss here in this category. We'll start with Cole Komet. Cole Komet, to me, is fits straight in that good category. I don't think he's a top player in the league. I don't think he's a Pro Bowl, cal Pro Bowl caliber player in this league. Um, but he is absolutely what you want in a Chicago Bear. That means a lot. Obviously, being a hometown kid, he has a lot of pride in, in what he does in his craft and being a Chicago Bear, and that means a lot. He's extended, so there's nothing to worry about as far as you know him being on the team next year. He does everything well. He's a Y tight end. He's not a U tight end. He's a true Y. He can block in line. And what you love about him in the past game, even though he's not super nifty defeating one-on-one -on -one coverage, he doesn't have great feel at the top of his routes. What you love about him in the past game is his consistency. He had one drop the entire year on a, on a shit ton of targets. Like, he is – outstanding with his hands he's a great dude to me he's he's an easy guy that fits right in that good category um there may be some people in the building that would put him in that top player category i see him more as good yeah i'm going to be here to argue that he should be in the top player category top 10 in receiving yards at his position um higher than some guys that were drafted higher than him, just in terms of their, their given draft years. Um, I think his production has, well, it has improved every single year. I like that. He's 25. Love it. Which, which seems like he's been in the league a long time already, like only getting better. I love that the drop rate like considerably decreased. I love his value in the run game. I get that. He may not be able to do everything that Travis Kelsey can do, but I see potential there. So if I'm arguing, I see top player. I'm going to argue top player, but at the very least, it's like darn all right again. He's in that good category for me with a huge arrow up. I, I can't believe he's still 25 years old. Like he's entering the prime of his career. Where I think my, my expectations for 2024, he's going to be a top player for the Chicago Bears. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I agree with both of you guys right now. Um, I think it's just a matter of, you know, He's sort of a tweener, I think, between those top two tiers. Um, is he ever, does he still have room for upside? 
Hell yes, he does. Um, he's still young. But to Josh's point, in terms of what type of tight end he is, is he ever going to have that sort of elite wiggle um, that, that you would need to consistently get open all the time? No, he does not have that. But there are moments where he does. And I, I, I don't know how much he's working on that kind of stuff personally. It's still something I think could get a little better. But if we're defining the top player category as good to better than good on a good team. Like I think about the football I just watched over the weekend. Can I see Cole Komet running out there having an outstanding game in an NFC championship game? And um, you know, maybe he's not catching as many passes as Travis Kelsey did in, in the AFC game, but he's going to have a big impact and play well in big moments. I feel like so I don't know if I have to be the tiebreaker on this one, but I'm kind of leaning more Johns too, that where I would slip him into that top player it. category. I love it. We drafted him. I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Awesome. It, it. Bottom line regard. This is like, you know, this is, uh, this is more of a snapshot. This guy's on the team and he's part of the foundation, which is huge. And he's exactly what you want in a foundational player. Um, and I hope he just keeps getting better and better because he's a great person, and um, to see his jump from three to four was was awesome. That's something I was going to mention, too. I think you do, if there's a tiebreaker in it, I think that leadership aspect, the way he fits into this team, um, you know, is maybe that, you know, it's the slightest thing. But let, to your point, you, you, this is not a player you have to spend too much time arguing about over which category he comes in because he's here to stay anyway. Absolutely. Um, Let's go to Mercedes Lewis, who I think is a very interesting player to discuss this offseason. Yeah, so he's, you know, to me, he's a three. He would be an arrow down. Um, based on how he played, if he wants to keep playing, he's a UFA. I didn't put him in the move on category because he performs his role well. He does a good job. He seems to be very well liked. Um, he plays obviously on uh, very low cheap deals that are team friendly. Um, these third blocking tight ends are hard to find and he still do does it at a high level. And if he's good in the locker room to me, I would want him back and I would put him in that, that um, average category. Cause he doesn't really fit, you know, he's not in the, in the circumstance. We know what he is. Um, and then he's obviously not a solid starter. So to me, he'd be in that three category average. Yeah. hundred percent agree. I, I do think the intangibles will matter for like the next part of this discussion. And I'm open to bringing him back. If I'm in that room, I say, bring him back. If you want a reliable third blocking tight end who can still move people quite, quite well. And who seems to be beloved in that locker room, such a, like a resource, for, for younger players, not just like the tight end room, but, but throughout the roster. And to see the reaction that the entire team had when he scored that touchdown late in the season and Matt Eberflus is screaming, big dog, like big dog should come back next year in 2024 if he wants to be part of the Chicago Bears. Yeah, I agree. And and I would even, I mean, he, he'd honestly be a guy that in this media I'd be pounding the table. I Let's bring him back. Let's, let's make sure he's not going anywhere because – um, you know, it's not, it probably is not going to cost you anything that is going to be catastrophic by any means. If it doesn't go well, for some reason, his attitude, he wants to keep playing. He's great in that locker room. He's somebody for a lot of players to look up to in there. And, and, uh, and, and by the way, when he's out there on the field, he plays pretty damn well too. So I, I agree. I think he's in this average category because he's obviously not a starting tight end anymore that you're going to have out there, um, you know, for 70% of the game. But he's still he's still got value value to me, so I'm definitely not putting him in that move on category. Um, how about the last one though, Robert Tanyan? To me, this is the you know one of the biggest needs on this team is a true U tight end. You know, you have your big blocking all Y third you know third guy we just talked about. You have your well rounded Y and Cole Komet. Um, I think they thought Tanyan could add a little bit more in the past game. Um, but what he showed was a guy that has never really recovered from his injury. He doesn't have the movement of a U tight end. 
and he's not even a good blocker. You know, he's not even really a functional blocker. You know, I thought it was very disappointing, especially trying to block in space. Um, I thought this guy was very disappointing. I think there was a reason we saw more Colin Johnson late in the year um, to give him a little bit more juice at that position. I think U tight ends a huge position to need. This guy's a free agent. Um, and to me, he goes straight to that move on category. They need someone younger, faster, um, can contribute more on special teams and then and contribute more in the past game. Yeah. I'm with another, you, another, another getsy binky that, you know, you know, now he doesn't have, you know, the, the protection from the, from the coach. Yeah. hundred percent agreed. Um, time to move on UFA older guy injury history production. Wasn't there. There'll be other options, be it the draft or earlier on in free agency. Simple decision for me. Yeah, 100% agree. And I meant to bring this up when we got done with the O-line, too. So let's just do it for both positions real quick here. Um, so you tight end is is something we're putting on the need list for the offseason. Um, and then how are you looking at the needs, Josh, for the offensive line? Obviously, they have to address starting center. You know, whether that's through free agency or through the draft, um, they have a lot of young developmental guys that we're not going to talk about that could probably fill in some of those depth positions. Um, but I think center is number one on the needs list. And then I do think they have to start thinking the next two things they have to really be talking about are our um, good long-term guard, you know, what do they really think about Tevin? Is he going to be around long-term? Um, and then left tackle obviously would be like for us, we would have left tackle and then a question mark. Um, probably the last thing we would have to address. Cause I think Braxton is good enough to play this next year um, with all the other needs they need to, to worry about. Um but the, the most interesting, I think the center thing is obvious. Anyone in the city of Chicago can tell you they have to address starting center. The most interesting conversation is what, what are we doing long-term with Tevin? Cause that could play a huge role. And if they were to take a guard early in this draft, but to me, it would be center guard left tackle question mark. Yeah, I, I agree with that a hundred percent. I, it just, the, the, Guard things hard because you don't want to be caught in a situation where a year from now, eh, can't sign Tevin because he didn't stay healthy and Nate Davis didn't take the jump in his yep. second year. Now you need two guards, so that's the now, now there's a glaring hole. Like yeah. everybody knows you need a guard. <laughs> so this that... league, this league's crazy. I've seen it a million times where you go from a really good strength to a a, a huge void on your roster and a blink of an eye and you're like, how did that just happen? Um, so that, that it, would it be fair to say one way to handle that is you don't necessarily throw a lot of money at the position, but if the right guard on your draft board ends up being available, even in the second or third round, you, you don't hesitate to take one. 100%. If you love that player and you think he's going to be a really good starting guard and you have in the back of your mind that you're not going to pay Tevin Jenkins because you don't trust him. There's no no reason you should hesitate to pull uh, pull the trigger on a, a interior offensive lineman that you really like. All right, um, let's go to wide receiver now, and we'll we'll start with the number one guy, DJ Moore. Easy, best you know, best year of his career. I thought, you know, he brought the explosive run after catch. I think that was so important um, as far as, um, you know, what this team was lacking, you know, rack, rack production, um, which is such a huge part of this league right now. Um, his volume was up in every category. This is the easiest guy to place. He's a top player in this league. Um, he's under contract and you need, you just need to add more guys that have this kind of explosive playmaking ability. Yep. No, to, no to debates from, 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 from me here. Um, what, what I like, like as we get into the quarterback conversation, which is going to be like a four month long like process or a four month long conversation, DJ Moore produces with every single quarterback. It, it, it doesn't matter whom that player is because it's just happened. The history says it will happen. 
He's a top player, one of the top receivers in the game, an outstanding electric player, great team, great teammate, great leader, top player for me. Yeah, 100%. No need to to keep talking about that one. He's a top player. Um, Let's move on to Darnell Mooney, who is – this one might bring a little bit more debate to the table. Yeah, and going back real quick on – I mean, you look at DJ Moore. That if – let's just say they draft the USC quarterback and he becomes – a franchise quarterback, you, you know, you're talking about Ryan Poles will go down as, you know, pulling off one of the best transactions in, in Bears history to, to not only get a receiver of that caliber, but also the first pick in the draft that could potentially change this franchise. So obviously that's a big if still, we got to see how that guy pans out, but to get, to get the player the way they got him is even is just as impressive as a player as he is. Darnell Mooney, um, you know, obviously production down in all areas this year. You know, this will be very interesting on how the new offensive coordinator views this player. Some information that would be huge for us on this player is the injury and the GPS data that we don't have. I see a player that doesn't have the same short area explosiveness and I didn't see the same long speed that I saw the first three years in the league. They have more information. Is he going to get that back or is this injury always going to be a concern? That's going to play a major, major role in the decision-making of this player. As far as where he is to me on this list, I think he's a good, he's a good starter to me. Now, You'll probably get some arguments this year. Maybe he fell more into that average category, but I've seen this guy long enough. I know what he is. Um, he's a good starter on any team. Um, he can play inside. He can play outside. Um, I think part of the little weakness with him a little bit is he's not a true X, Y, um, you know, or Z. Like he kind of can play all three as elements of all of them. Um, so he's really like a third receiver to me uh, on, a, on a good team. He's like a third starting receiver. Um, but for me, I would put him in the two category. And this is going to be a very interesting uh, free agency, um, you know, to, to watch with with Darnell, because clearly they need to add um, two starting receivers if he's not one of them. I'm with you. Like, we know he could be a good player. I feel like I want to blend this with, with circumstance like. Something just fell off for, for two years in this offense with Luke Getze. And obviously the Bears now fired Luke Getze. So, like, maybe that was ski. Maybe he couldn't fit into it. Or, or Luke Getze just struggled to find ways to get him the ball over two seasons. But then you see the production with DJ Moore. Like, that's instantaneous. Um, to me, and I know free agency – become or comes first before the draft like like this is the biggest circumstance for me like if we're getting rid of justin fields and darnell mooney has any sense of that i don't think he wants to be here i think he wants to he would want to leave like he would see better opportunities elsewhere for his career and maybe shane waldron can, can convince him Oh, you know, to, to change his mind, but um, I'm with you. I, I don't mind keeping him in the good because we've seen what he can do. Um, but I think there's a lot of circumstance here with Darnell Mooney to consider. Yeah, I think if we're honest, we're being honest about what Mooney has become. I, I put him more in the average tier because I, I have questions about if you can still win with him right now um, as your number two to DJ Moore, I think it's a spot you need to upgrade. Um, And part of that is I agree, Josh, that I have questions about how healthy he actually is. There were times this season where he would catch a ball in the flat and just did not seem to have that same burst Mm -hmm. that he used to have. And I I was honestly like, is he, is he playing hurt right now? Like did something pop up? Is this just the injury from last year? It was like really hard to figure out because then, you know, he might catch a ball the next quarter and look, faster and and so i i I don't know if it's just him having to cut one direction or you know it just did something seemed off there and that's only information the bears will still have 
um, on, on what that injury has and the data that they have on him right now. But I, I tend to want to put him more in that average category right now. And um, it, I think a change of scenery is what's going to end up happening here. Anyway. So, so if I'm the tiebreaker, my blending of good and circumstance would put him in the average then. So I'll, I'm okay with the average. Average it is. He's, um, you know, the, the data, you know, they'll have all that. They know how fast he's running every practice compared to the first three years he was there. Um, to me, that is a huge part of this decision. Um, he's a smaller player. He has to have his speed. What makes him good is his, his quickness, acceleration, and his speed. Um, so if they think that is an arrow down already, it's going to be an easy decision for them to part ways. He will definitely have a lot of interest throughout the league. Um, I don't think he's going to get a crazy contract. I think he's going to be around a 10 million a year guy. Um, but you got to remember the core group of guys who drafted this player are, are spread out through the league right now in different organizations, you know, obviously with Ryan and down in Atlanta, um, you know, uh, champs over in Vegas, but the person who loved this player the most wanted to draft this player the most and made him a thousand yard receiver is the offensive coordinator for the Kansas city chiefs, a a team that has huge needs at wide receiver. He fits what they do really, really, really well. Do not be surprised to see Darnell Mooney in a Kansas city chiefs uniform next year. I can already picture it. I was honestly surprised, and maybe there were discussions, and we just don't know it, that they didn't try to trade for him at the trade deadline, given yeah, what their needs were in the middle of the year, and I don't think it would have cost them a ton. The cost, obviously, what what, what what would the cost be? Maybe they know. Maybe they see decline. You know, like, it's there's the, the, the whole injury thing and the speed is, is going to be at the top of every discussion in all 32 buildings when they're talking about this player. All right, let's move on to Tyler Scott uh, after his rookie season. Tyler Scott would fit in that circumstance, kind of unsure. I did not think this guy had a chance to be a player after the preseason. I was not impressed. I saw small. I didn't see special. I saw fast, but I didn't see NFL fast, um, and I didn't see play strength. As the season went on, I started to become more of a Tyler Scott fan. This guy has a chance. This guy would be in that four category for me with an arrow up. I still remember that dig route he ran in, uh, in, in Bajan's first game where he kind of had that stutter like to show like that savvy at the top of the route. That sticks out to me as a real positive. Um, he had some clutch catches down the stretch. But I also remember third and 10 versus Detroit to seal the deal, win the game, and he doesn't track that ball. He's a player that is going to be used vertically. He's got to be able to track those balls and go and and, and win and catch those balls consistently. Um, Was it just the lighting in that stadium? Hard place to play? I don't know. Is is, Does he have tracking issues? I don't know. We'll see. But he's he's arrow up to me. He's an exciting player. And um, I think at minimum next year, he's playing a role um, uh, for this team, no different than he did uh, last year. And I wouldn't be shocked if he's one of the three starters. I really wouldn't, depending on how things shake out in free agency and in, in, in the draft. I've seen crazier things happen. If he has a huge offseason, he's, he's, he's an interesting player. Agreed. Uh, I, I thought there were some things from training camp that I liked that didn't carry over into the season. I don't know if that's just the ups and downs that Justin Fields had himself. I'd like him... I, I like his potential. I think it's still there. I, I thought we saw enough signs that it's still there that he could be. I'm not saying he's going to be a number one, but he could be one of your top three receivers. The arrow is up. He's a young player. It's his second year. I'm with you with circumstance. So I'm, I'm, I agree on the category. Um, I think this is a player that I, I would say we'll know real fast next year if he's made a jump or not. And, and, how much he can actually be counted on. This was a player that when I would watch practices and training camp, I liked him. He would get open. He had some really, I mean, really nasty routes in camp against some solid players. And then it 
didn't translate to the games at all early on in the season. But I agree that there were then flashes later in the year where you were like, oh, wow, that was an impressive route. The problem is he didn't make the play at the top and the contested catches aren't really there right now. Um, There's also the touchdown. Which game was that? It was later in the year. Was that oh, in the back of the end zone? Yeah. Forget which game it was. His, where he didn't get his foot down. Yeah. No, he just didn't make the catch. It was, he sort of had to adjust to it just a little bit, but it was one of those balls from a quarterback downfield. You're like, come on, make a play for your quarterback. Yeah. And it just didn't happen. That that's so, going to define his ability to go downfield because he is a speed player to go downfield and make catches consistently, whether that's going up and fighting for balls, whether that's tracking balls and having to adjust and make those difficult catches. That's going to define, you know, if he becomes a starter or not. That's what he's going to have to really, really show he can do consistently. Yeah. So um, I agree on this category right now, and he will definitely be somebody to keep an eye on early on in uh, camp next year. Really more so, I think, in the games to see if that has improved and he can start making some plays for the quarterback downfield. All right. Um, who should we go to next? Equinemius St. Brown? I guess that works. Another, you know, Green Bay. <laughs> Uh, uh, you know, brought over to you know be a coach's binky guy that they can trust. You know, I put him in the three category. He's a he's a free agent. Um, obviously, if they bring him back, you know, it's a minimum deal. He's just a role player. He's never going to be anything more than a role player. I do like he can block. I think receivers blocking is becoming more and more the way teams are running the ball um, and, and especially this wide zone stuff, which I think uh, the new OC is going to bring. Um, there's going to be some appeal to the toughness and, and kind of the role he plays. Um, but as far as a receiver, he's just a guy. He's never going to be a guy that can win one-on-one consistently. Most of his production is going to come against zone. He's just a role player. You know, I don't see him arrow up, arrow down. I, I put him in the uh, three category just kind of as an average player. But, you know, I, I wouldn't fight, you know, if, if, if someone wanted to move him down. Yeah, I'm going to put him in move on just because I think if I'm Shane Waldron or if I'm just in this room as an assistant coach, I think it's important that we move on from the previous coordinators, guys. In, in a sense, like let's get Shane Waldron's guys in here. Let's 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 move him those preferences up our tiers chart in, in a sense here. So he's a move on for me. Injuries didn't really play much, do much. I like I, I do like him as a blocker, but I feel like we could replace that. All right, I'll be the tiebreaker here. I'll I'll, I'll agree with Josh and keep him in average um, because I do think he's reliable. Like there was there was re- reliable, maybe not from the you know, the injuries did pop up standpoint, but when he's on the field, you know, he's not going to screw up anything like he's, you know, he's reliable as a blocker. He's not going to have stupid penalties. He's not going to be out there taunting anyone and cost you 15 yards. Um, I understand the argument that new OC probably time to move on. My guess is they do move on um, because of that, but I'm not quite there yet where I, I'm like, yeah, he can't help us. We definitely should just move on right now. Yeah, the, the big discussion will be when you have a when you have a receiver game day active who's four or five or six, if he can play on all the core special teams and he's smart enough to play all three positions, even if he lacks the talent that we think should put him on this team, that gives you a lot of value and a lot of trust for your coaches um, because what can happen on a game day with injury. So that's going to play a big role on how they see this player um, moving forward, whether he's worth bringing back or not. And and I'll go back to the beginning of the season on this one, because remember he was inactive to start the year as they were trying to force feed Claypool into the situation. Yeah. Um, And, it was driving me crazy because I'm you're watching Claypool try to block out there and it was a disaster and he doesn't give you anything elsewhere. Um, and it, it's just that reliability that you kind of knew you had with St. Brown, if he's going to be active now, my hope would be you're not in that same position come September where you need a guy like that active. But as we discussed this in late January, 
that's why I'm not quite ready to put him in that move on tier. Yeah. And even, even with a guy like this, I know we're spending too much time on him. You do resign him. It's going to be a minimum deal. If he does, you know, if you get guys better than him in the draft and other free agency moves, you cut him. It's not a big move. It's not a big deal. So to me, that's why I kept him in the average category and not the move on. Because if you do resign him, it's not going to be something that you can't cut if you if you have better. All right, uh, two more quickly wide receivers to discuss. Let's start with Valus Jones Jr. Valus Jones Jr. Uh, if he could return punts, he'd be the perfect weapon. He would he would remind me of. Um, kind of the Cordell Patterson role where you could be your kick returner, punt returner, gadget guy, and then when he touches the ball, he gets first downs. That's what I know. He's explosive, but his limitations at receiver are major, obviously. He's not a guy they trust putting out there playing multiple positions, and his inability to return punts is absolutely, you know, it's almost it's almost fatal for his roster value. But he is that talented where, you know, they keep him around and he touches the ball and he produces. I put him in that four category still, still kind of unsure circumstance. And, you know, you know, will they ever trust him enough to return punts? Uh, if they do, I could see him being around here for a long time. If he never gets to that point, you know, he's probably not going to last here much longer past his rookie deal. I'm putting him in, in circumstance for now. I, I think he's just squarely in it. Still a draft pick. Not on the, the younger side of things. I'm not sure I'm giving him an arrow up or maybe there's an arrow down. Small one if, if there's such a thing. So maybe no arrow at all. Draft pick. Still fast. Still gives you some value in special teams. To your point, Josh, I don't like that he's can't return punts. That's why Trent Taylor is, is on the roster. You have another players taking up his a roster spot because Bayless Jones Jr. can't return punts and it was Trent Taylor out there in like certain situations too for for certain play calls you know when it, when blocking was needed um by receivers so circumstance just just feels right and I don't think he's going to get any better than that for for right now yeah I would actually put him in below average um, and I'm not gonna be able to break this tie here with that, but that's what I would sit in the meeting and say, because to me, he's just a guy filling out the 90 man roster right now, because there's too many, there, there, there's too many issues there where he, 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 you can't just have them. I, I would, I would argue very strongly if I'm in that room as, as a member of that bears front office, we can we have to solve this where we don't have to use a roster spot for both punt returner and kick returner this year. So now he's only going to his third year. So it's not like you got to get rid of him right now. Absolutely. But but this guy better learn how to um, return punts or else. And right now, unfortunately, I think we know he's just not going to happen. They gave him that chance. It didn't go well. It's they've given him multiple chances. And I, I because of that, I can't even put him in circumstance. Um, he's limited as a wide receiver at this point, like my last ditch effort would be what can he give you out of the backfield as, as a Cord Cordell Patterson running back type guy um, in, in certain situations. So for me, I would actually have him in below average. Um, all right. And then the, uh, I guess quickly on Trent Taylor, where, you know, sort of the same conversation again, he's a, he's a free agent. He'd be a move on for me. You got to have better and punt return um, and you can find better slot receivers I think Tyler Scott, you know, hopefully can develop into maybe a punt returner could help solve that situation. Or one of these young receivers that they draft or sign is going to have to be able to return punts. Um, but to me, Trent Taylor, he was just your safe option. Guys like this are always available on the street if you need to go back to a safe option. Free agent, not good enough, need better as a returner and as a slot. He'd be a move on guy for me. Like I, I wouldn't mind putting him in the below average, you know, just going off the description, backup, fill in player for an any man rash. Cause that's that's what he was. That's what he was signed to do. He was signed to to fill in a punt returner because Valus Jones Jr. couldn't do it and he filled in as a blocker. But his age. I'm with you. Move I, I'm comfortable putting him in, in, in move on. I, I feel like he could return in some capacity, but I'm not sure he's going to be on that 53. Yeah, move on. 
yeah, it, it got to find better. You got to find somebody that can do both in the return game or give you more as a wide receiver at the same time. And yes, it was, what a great problem to solve if Tyler Scott can kind of become all three of those things this off season. Yeah. I mean, that would, that would solve a lot of problems right there. So I'm going to go with move on there as well. All right. Running back position. Um, let's start with Khalil Herbert. Khalil Herbert to me is, you know, I'll be a high guy here. I think he's a good running back in the NFL. I think he's a solid starter that would start on most teams. He, there's just something subtle and slippery about him. He's always a high yards per uh, yards yards per carry guy. He's got feel. He's got instinct. He's capable in the pass game. He's never going to be a top player, um, but when you put him in there, he produces. I thought he was on his way to having a hell of a season. Um, the injury really derailed him, um, and he really didn't get going again until the end of the year. Obviously, benefits from a good run blocking O line. Um, I think he's a good player. A lot of people probably uh, argue he's in that average category, and I'm good with him in either spot. Late round pick. He's cheap. He's going to be on the roster next year. Yeah, I agree with you. Like, if I'm just looking at like my current roster, and I'm in that room. Khalil Herbert's my our best running back. Um, I I was concerned just like you, like oh no, like he's lost something here. That injury took something away. Um, but he seemed to get it back with every carry, especially as the games and the weeks started to add up. That burst was there. That that one cut, you know, quick up the field, it, it was there. I'm okay putting him in the good category because I think he's a good running back who's could produce in, in a good offense. And if we're making improvements to that offensive line. I like where we at. I like where we're at at a starting point with Khalil Herbert, but I would still, for still talking about needs offensively, I would put running back up there, maybe behind receiver and behind you know offensive center. Yeah, that's why I would. Um, I, I kind of look at him almost like I look at Braxton Jones, where like, yeah, we can live with him for another year, and you know he's going to be a solid player, and we like you know his intangibles and. He, he he he's a starting caliber player for us, but you know if we have the opportunity to to upgrade, um, let's go ahead and do it. And honestly, it's even easier with the running back position, right? Because you're already going to use multiple backs anyway. Um, whereas you know if you're going to have a replacement for Braxton Jones, that puts Braxton Jones down into a swing tackle position right away. So. You know, I'm not going to quibble too much on whether or not he should be good or average. I'd probably put him in that average spot with Braxton Jones, too. But I really did like seeing that burst come back late in the year. Because I think if I had not seen that, I would have definitely had him down in the average category. Without a doubt. Four, 4.9 yards per carry for his career, which is, you know, really, really impressive. Um, and a guy that, to me, I agree, like, are they going to pay him a lot of money after next year? You know, probably not. He'll probably go on somewhere else. And it's a, it's a position where you're seeing teams just keep drafting young guys after young guys. Um, but there's something to be said for when a guy gets in a game, he consistently produces. And, and to me, um, if he's your starting back next year uh, and you have that solid rotation behind him with Roshan and, and, and whoever else they add, um, you can be, you're, you're going to be happy with that. So are we Kent, putting him in good? Are we putting yeah, good? Kent, you can put him in good. They had a two versus three vote there on me, so that's fine. Yes. <laughs> um, let's see who, who would be next. Yeah, uh, Deontay Foreman. Foreman it, to me is just an average player. You know, he was three nine per year per, per carry this year. You know, he's probably best you know placed on a practice squad. You know, because he doesn't have, have much, if he's not starting. He doesn't have a ton of value, but if you have injuries, you absolutely love him because he's a hell of a, you know, he's a really good first and second down running back. Who's just good, you know, a check down screen guy game, you know, in, in the past game. Um, I would say he's average. Um, you know, he's dependable um, when he's in there and he has to play. It's just, if you have Roshan and you have Khalil healthy as a third back, doesn't give you a lot of value because he can't play on fourth down um, and he ends up being inactive. And, and we saw that early in the year and he really didn't get his chance until there was injuries. But, but where he fits, 
I would say he's an average player. This guy's a free agent. If he wants to come back here, I would see no reason why they wouldn't re-sign him and bring him to camp again. It would be a minimum deal that it would be cuttable if they have better uh, and they find better through the draft. Yeah, he's, he's your backup running back. There, there was a point in time during the season where I thought, like, he seemed to fit the identity, like the violent, you know, north-south identity that the Bears wanted to have for a bit, but then he would seem to get tackled two yards short of, uh, of like, <laughs> I felt like there was more yards to gain on, on some of his runs. Um, like, if he could just break a tackle or just, you know, it, it just seemed there. Uh, he was a backup. He fits that average category, I think, perfectly. Yeah, I'm fine with that. Uh, the pass blocking, too, was an issue for me throughout the season, uh, kind of across the board with a lot of these running backs, but um, definitely when Deontay Foreman was out there, too. So um, I'm good with that. Let's talk about Roshan Johnson next. Just real, real quick, you know, when free agency starts in March, it goes for about two or three weeks where names are popping off, popping off. And then you walk into your free agency board and the same two positions are still littered with names like box safeties, like down safeties that don't play well in the back and first and second down running backs. Like there's just a bunch of them. You're like, man, he's still out there. No one signed him. That That's who Foreman is. That That's the guy. Like there's, there's 10 of them every year um, because they just, they just they're just supply demand wise. There's just more. There's more of them than there are that teams are coveting because they can't play on special teams. Mo moving to Roshan, you know, I would put him in that three right now with that. He'd be an arrow up guy. Losing David Montgomery's presence and toughness and ruggedness, I thought it was really important that they added this guy because I think he brings some of that to the table. I love the violence this guy plays with. He's not a pure natural runner. You can see, you can see it wasn't his, you know, he, he's new to the position. You know, it's not, doesn't have like the natural feet and feel. Um, but man, he does show you some ability to create at times. Um, and I thought as the season went on, he showed it more and more. Heavy volume guy in the past game, tough as hell, play special teams, rookie deal. I would put him in that average category and you hope he gets to the good category, and he's a guy that I think they, they're excited about, especially as a fourth-round draft pick. Yeah, I mean, he's a player who's on your 53 for a lot of different reasons. For you know, sure. Like pass blocking and third down, his ability to play in different phases on special teams. You like his youth. If I had, like, one concern that emerged last year, so he has this concussion, he misses some time, and it took, at least to me watching, some time for him to get back to being that physical guy that made him so valuable to the Bears, that, that ruggedness that you wanted to see. Um, I thought he got some of that back. Um, I'd like to see more of that. You know, concussions are obviously something you have to treat very, very seriously. But, yeah, he's in that average category. Again, I think it's like one of those things where I don't like him in there with Foreman because I think Johnson has the arrow up. So maybe you do something to highlight him a little bit more. Um, but I'm comfortable with him in that in that level uh, i'm totally good with that too and i agree yeah especially when you you factor in the f the special team's ability um that's kind of like that that category sort of personifies exactly what roshan johnson was um with an arrow pointing up hopefully that he can he can be more do we uh look i'm a fullback guy do we want to discuss car blasting game you know what uh, you know if it, it's keep it simple i think he'd be fit in that average category you know, he's a he's an average st starting fullback in this league. It all comes down to the new OC and how his vision is for do they want a true fullback uh, and play a lot of 21 personnel uh, or can they get away with a tight end in 21 personnel like a lot of teams are doing. San Francisco obviously shows you how they do it with Juszczyk, um, a guy that can kind of be more of a, you know, a, a – play a little fullback and tight end um, or do they want the true old school fullback? That's what it will come down to the decision, whether this guy's on the roster or not next year, if he's on, if they want a true fullback to me, he's a good guy to have on the roster. He does his job. He's a solid fullback. Yep. I'm with you. No debate here. It all depends what you, what Shane Waldron wants to do offensively. Yeah. And my understanding is he's been more of the hybrid type mm -hmm 
guy rather than through a fullback. So um, that'll be interesting to see how that plays out specifically with that position. Yeah, your special, uh, your special teams coach loves it when your when your offensive coordinator likes to play with more of a tight end body at fullback because now that gives you a better athlete yeah on on all your special teams units usually these old school sawed off fullbacks like blasting game they're capable of playing special teams but they're not ideal body types so that 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 conversation between the oc and the special teams coordinator also plays a whole role in this deal as well um and i think you're right i think you know i think they'll probably end up going more to to, to that hybrid type player more than this old school, you know, fullback. All right. Are we ready to have the quarterback conversation? Absolutely. Can we start with Tyson? <laughs> <laughs> hey, yeah, yeah. Let's start with Tyson to get it out of the way. Okay. You know, I mean, right now I put him, you know, I put him in that, um, th he can go in the three as a, as an average, you know, starter backup. You can put him in the circumstance, like young, exciting, still arrow up. Here's the bottom line. This is an outstanding college free agent signing. This is a guy that now that you've seen him play four games, you can absolutely trust that he can come in there and do the job and give your team a chance to win. He's got intangibles. He's a better athlete than you think. He can process, play fast with his mind. He's just always going to be limited, obviously, with his physical traits. You now get a backup quarterback that you trust for three years on a rookie deal. That is absolutely huge because the going rate right now is $10 million a year for these backup quarterbacks. Yeah. And, now, and now you just saved yourself. you know. And I'm sure they'll pay him some money at some point in time. But it's like this is a hell of a signing. This is a hell of a job by them to identify him, recruit him up since the senior bowl, get him in the building. Um, and you got a backup quarterback you can trust that's young, that's only going to get better um, and is extremely cheap. It's going to add, uh, add fiscal flexibility to, to, to your spending offensively. Um, to me, regardless of the category, average or circumstance, um, very, very excited about this player being on the roster. Yeah, this is where you have to actually thank Luke Getze for a moment here, you know, because of their senior bowl connections. But but I'm with you. Average category with that backup label, have you. He proved he could be uh, a more than better, more than capable backup in this league, going two and two in his four starts. Had some pretty good moments. Uh, obviously, there are some things from the game against the Saints that you don't like, but learning experiences for a young quarterback who just played division two division two football the bears found a good one they, they found a good quarterback a good young quarterback a good young backup quarterback to have yeah no need to say much more than that totally agree great find perfect in that average category um and fills what otherwise probably would have been a, another need to have to address this offseason um now the question is what is the need at starting quarterback <laughs> where are you placing justin fields i would place him in the two category i you know i think he's a solid starter um having a solid starter at quarterback is you know it's not ideal you want your quarterback to be a top player um if your quarterback is in the two category, you better have a lot of players around him in the top player. We just saw it this weekend. You know, I, I wouldn't put Jared Goff or 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 um, Purdy in the top player category, but they're surrounded by a lot of top players, and you can win that way. And that's probably a little that's that's part of the thinking with Justin Fields going forward. Um, I don't think he can ascend to top player category. I think there's probably a lot of people in the building that wouldn't even put him at good. They would put him in the average category and see him more as a circumstantial starter because this past game stuff so inconsistent. Um, 
I'm giving him a little bit of the benefit of the doubt. I wouldn't fight anyone that put him in the three, that average category. Um, I think he's good. I think you can win with him. Um, I just think they're in a very unique situation where they can improve because of the draft pick they have. Um, if they did not have this number one draft pick, um, I think he'd be a guy that they'd be willing to go forward and, and try to build around um, and get as talented as you can around him because he's wired right to play in the city and he's just good enough to win you some games. Um, but he's not ideal and they're in a situation that they can maybe draft an ideal guy. Um, and I think that's why they're going to go ahead and take a quarterback with that first pick. You love his leadership. You love his intangibles. You love the things that he can do that other quarterbacks simply cannot do, but you don't like the production in the passing game. Like that needs to be better. Like he is a, bottom third quarterback in the league in really every major important statistical category for quarterback play. And then the numbers even get worse when it matters most, like third downs, um, two minutes. Uh, Ryan Poles mentioned that himself. The, four, the fourth quarter, when games are, where, where even the blowouts become, you know, close games in one in the fourth quarter. Um, like I guess where I would struggle with it, like if you're putting Purdy and Jared Goff in that good category, just looking at the numbers, you're just like, does Justin belong with them? Just like Brock Purdy's production was MVP caliber worthy this year for the 49ers, and Jared Goff's numbers are, are just great. Um, but yet I'm still with you. Like there were improvements made by Justin Fields, like the sack rate decrease the interception race decreased He's still not good enough to make major strides amongst his peers but those are important for him i'm okay with him in this good category um that may go against a lot of things i said i do think you can win with him i think he brings a lot to you in that locker room but there are especially again given this unique situation like, this is a long debate. Like, this is multiple meetings. This is multiple conversations oh, yeah. for me. And this is just getting going. Like, this, when this meeting happens with Shane Waldron, like, that's a long meeting. And I want more meetings with Shane Waldron. Like, there are so many things to get through because you should have a whole meeting about Cale Williams, too. Like, there's a for lot. For sure. You know, the, before you go in to start this meeting, the GM is going to grab the head coach, the OC, the top personnel lieutenants, and he's going to say, Hey, let's keep it. Let's keep it brief on the quarterback. Let's just put him where we think we're going to have long, long talks amongst ourselves, you know, that we don't have to do, um, you know, and, and obviously whether you put him in the good or you put him in the average, it's not going to change their long-term decision-making process. Yeah, 100%. I had a longer meeting yesterday on CHGO about the quarterback, so uh, I'll keep it brief here in this one, too. But this is exactly where I place him. I believe Justin Fields is a starter in the NFL, not a backup. I think he's a starting quarterback, but definitely not the top tier, not the not the type of guy that right now you're you're running to pay and you got to have meetings. Even if you didn't have the top pick, you would be having meetings about whether or not to pick up that fifth year option right now. Um, but you do have the top pick, and that certainly changes the calculus a lot. So Justin Fields is exactly where he should be. In this and good that's category. a good way to put it. Like, he is a starting quarterback. He is better than a lot of the quarterbacks that played this season. Like, there were, what, 60-plus quarterbacks who played this, this year? Justin Fields is better than a whole lot of them. He just is. He is. But this is such a rare forget like unique but like a rare situation to be in for the bears to have the first pick with a young emerging roster with a roster that even if you do take Caleb Williams is going to get better you can still build around Caleb Williams I don't get the argument that you can't build around them like there's still an opportunity to build around Caleb Williams Absolutely. But this is what is, is so nuanced to me is just it's just an amazingly rare situation for the Chicago Bears to be in with a roster that already looks pretty good but now you got the first pick and a potential game changer at quarterback. It's a lot to take in. 
And one of the most important things that we're not talking about is the Bears really need one or two teams to view Justin Fields in this good category and to really believe that they can win around them because they need to get, you know, whether it's a second round pick back, you know, I've heard people talking about first round pick. I don't think that's going to happen. Um, but if you can get a second or third round pick uh, to, to, um, to trade them, um, obviously that just gives you more uh, ammunition in the draft to, to build your roster up. And um, it, it's important that they, are able to, if they do move on from them, get something worthwhile back. So just to sum all this up, um, and we've already gone 90 minutes here, So, um, but when we look at our needs, there's you can put quarterback on there, but probably with a question mark, I would think, similar to what we said with left tackle. You know, you, you don't necessarily have to upgrade, but it's there. And, of course, the difference between those two spots is, well, you do have this number one pick with a huge opportunity potentially to upgrade a quarterback. Um, I believe you need two starting wide receivers. I don't know if, you know, some might quibble with that a little bit. I think it's two starting wide receivers. Absolutely. Um, one tight end, preferably a U tight end, and center. Are we missing anything there? I think that's, the, that, that's going to be the top of the list without a doubt. Um, obviously we touched on the guard situation looking long-term with, with Nate Davis, really one more year of guaranteed money and how you feel about Tevin, that guard thing could come into play. Um, but offensively, if you're taking a quarterback at one that takes that off the board, cause you have your backup already, you're just trying to sign a third guy, you know, to come into camp and be an arm. Um, and then, um, you know, I think running back position, it, it, draft one like you do every year, you know, late in the draft, somewhere in the third day. Um, uh, the U position, I think, is imperative. They have to get better there. Um, and then the center, like you said, um, is is whether you you pay a guy that's done it and, and is 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 performed at a at a solid starting level in the NFL, or you draft a guy that's you know whether he's a college center or, or a guy you you think can move inside and play center. Um, in the draft, but that has to be addressed. I think as we wrap this up and like I step now, like outside of that personnel meeting, I'm very interested in the influence of Shane Waldron and oh, yeah. what, what he wants to do. And it's beyond the quarterback, right? It's what he wants to build around the quarterback and what he values more. Does he want that big bodied receiver like DK Metcalf to go with DJ Moore or, or will he prefer a Brock Bowers? at number nine to get that, you know, that, that move tight end in a sense. So his influence will be interesting to track, you know, like starting in free agency or even like with some minor roster moves. It'll be kind of fun to watch. The, the, the run game that he wants to implement and how the offensive line coach teaches that run game and knows that run game, that mesh will be one of the single most important things that we won't hear about and read about, but inside that building is going to be critical. Um, and that's got to match up. I'm, I'm assuming obviously during the interviews, it went well. Um, and, and that was discussed thoroughly um, because that is a huge critical part of how this team is going to be successful, especially if they're playing with a young quarterback, you know, they have to continue to be a high level run game. Um, and, and depending on how they want to run, maybe, maybe they're going to be more wide zone. Maybe they're going to be more inside zone. That's going to be a huge factor, too, on what type of offensive linemen they look for. Um, so that's going to be interesting to, to watch, you know, and see that you know, it's a new it's a new coach. You know, there's going to be different types of players that he sees and covets versus the old offensive coordinator. So um, we'll see that unfold and based on, on the guys they start bringing in. All right. Well. There was our offensive meeting. Loved it. Great stuff, Josh. As always, we are going to get back together on Friday morning to do the defensive side of the football. And a lot of interesting discussions there, too. Um, of course, Dan, when's your special teams meeting? I, I was going to say, when when are we doing the special teams meeting? 
I'll do that one by myself. I'll just sit here and Santos got his deal, man. It's he got his deals. <laughs> you never heard Scales' name in ten years, so you know he does a good yeah, job. Yeah, but what about the punter? The punter went through some struggles this year. The punter, the punter. You know, I heard coming out of training camp was going to have one of the better years in the entire league, and and then you know, kind of hit that second year wall, but I think they're still excited about them. So I don't think any major, but the biggest thing on special teams, we talked about it. They got to figure out the punt returner um, and, yeah. and, not, and not use, you know, an extra roster spot just to have a punt returner. It's just, it's not um, efficient, functional uh, way to approach your 40, you know, your 48 man roster. All right. Well, stay tuned for Friday's episode as well. We'll break down all the defense. Josh, really appreciate your time. In the meantime, everyone should be reading The Athletic, theathletic.com slash Hogan Johns. Kevin Fishbane is down at the Senior Bowl this week, so you can get coverage there. Uh, we will also have a lot of Senior Bowl coverage this week on CHGO. We have Nicholas Moriano down there, too. So check out all of that uh, noon every day on CHGO. And... Uh, you can always find the show and all of our merchandise at hogueandjohns.com. Follow us on Twitter there as well, at hogueandjohns on Twitter. We are out of here for now, and uh, we'll be back later in the week to talk about the defense. Talk to you then. See you. Thanks, guys. <laughs>